This video is about the cassette tape from the mid 80s through to the early 90s, throughout my teenage years into my early 20s, this was the way that I used to listen to most of my music. However, recently I've heard people that are a lot younger than me, people who probably couldn't even remember listening to a cassette tape, talking about it. And when they do, it pretty much always goes like this. Yeah, of course, I remember tape. Do you remember you used to get the tape and you'd pull it out of the machine, all the tape would be stuck inside, and then you'd have to wind it back in with a big, and then you'd put it back in the machine. <laughs> yeah, tapes. Those things were terrible, weren't they? No, they're not. In fact, they can be pretty good. Now, this business about them getting stuck inside machines. I've still got all 200 and odd cassettes I bought in the 80s and 90s. They've all survived this long without getting stuck in any piece of equipment I've ever owned. Now, I'm not saying other people haven't had cassettes get stuck inside machines. I think it was most common in a car stereo on a hot day, a sticky pinch roller that hadn't been cleaned for ages could pull a tape inside a machine. But it's not something that I've experienced. Now this business about them sounding bad. Cassettes can actually sound remarkably good. How good? Well, that's what I'm going to try and find out in this video. I'm going to get some new equipment, try different noise reduction techniques, different types of tapes, and see if you can really get a tape sounding almost as good as a CD. So let's get on with the rest of the video. First off, let's make no bones about it. The reason that most people bought cassettes as opposed to CDs is because they were a heck of a lot cheaper, almost half the price in most places. And I know that's the reason that I bought mine. But however cheap something is, people won't go back and buy it again unless they're happy with it. And obviously they were happy with cassettes because it was the best selling format for the best part of 10 years. However, because most of the people buying cassettes were on a restricted budget, they were also listening to them on budget equipment and therefore never hearing the best that you could get out of a cassette. Now, if they were recording anything, they were probably recording off the radio. And if they were doing it, more than likely they weren't using decent quality tapes. Let's just have a look at the Boots catalogue and see how much tapes cost back in 1985. Well, you can see why someone had used the cheap stuff. If you look at the Boots pack of Ferrix 60 Minutes, a three pack for $1.99, or TDK D90s for $3.49 for a three pack. Compare that to the top of the range metal tape here, the TDK Metal MAR90, $5.99 for a single tape. Let's put that in the inflation calculator and see what that's worth nowadays. £17.22 for a single tape. You can see why not many people were using those back in the day. But that segues us neatly into talking about tape types. Let's have a look at the four different kinds of blank cassette you could buy, starting with the cheapest and worst on the left, working up to the best on the right. So we've got a ferro, a chrome, a ferrochrome and a metal. Convenient enough, those are labelled types 1, 2, 3 and 4. Now, you won't see many type 3 tapes around. This was a bit of a failed experiment, ferrochromium. Type 1's ferro and type 2's chrome. So you mix those together and you get ferrochromium. The idea was it was the best of both of those two. That one had good bass response, that had good treble response, so add those two together, you get ferrochromium. Bit of a failed experiment, never took off, you won't see those for sale at all nowadays. It was only a couple of years that those were on sale. So let's take that one out of the equation. So you've really got three different kinds of blank cassette you can find. Type 1, Type 2 and Type 4. Now it's easiest to go off the numbers because the manufacturers like to play around a little bit with the names of these. You'll notice these say normal position on them but also low noise and dynamic as well. So you can get a little bit confused with them. So just stick to the numbers. Type 2, chrome, also known as high position. And if we look at type 4, well, that just says metal class. So just stick to the numbers. Uh, type 4s are pretty expensive, but we'll talk more about that later on. Now, I'm keeping this thing very basic. There'll be people out there that'll argue with me and say you can get better type 1s and you can get type 2s sometimes if you get a good make, etc, etc. Yes, there are always exceptions. I'm just keeping things very simple here. So if we put these on their ends, you'll notice something about the tops of them. They've got different holes in them. We'll get that one out of the way because it's a bit see-through, a bit hard to see. We'll pull this other type 1 tape in. So I've got type 1 on the front, type 4 on the back. 
notice you've got the little things that you pick out if you want to right protect them but also next to those on the type 2 you've got a hole and on the type 4 you've got a hole next to those and two holes in the middle some cassette decks use these holes to identify what kind of cassette you've put in them because they need to know because you need to provide a metal tape with more power than you do a ferro tape to record onto it now some machines won't have those sensors but you'll find a switch on them and of course you've got to switch it to the right one so that it gives enough boost to the sound so it records it onto the tape as i say metal requires a greater stronger signal to record onto than a ferro tape or than a chrome tape now as far as pre-recorded albums go they generally either put them out on type 1 or type 2 tape ferro or chrome one of these is one and one's the other let's see if we can figure it out looking at the side of the box there's no immediate indicators other than the dolby symbol there so we'll get the cassette out of the box and see if we can figure out if this one is on chrome or on type one well nothing on the cassette itself just the uh, dolby symbol again so let's have a look at this other one and there you go there's the symbol chrome now they don't always put this on but that one tells us this one should be on a chrome tape and of course we've got the dolby symbol as well now just imagine you found these cassettes without their boxes there's no symbol on the cassette themselves to tell you whether or not it's type 1 or type 2 tape you'd think well look at the top of the tape doesn't work they're both in type 1 type cases you see you only really need those notches when it comes to recording on the tape when you get to playback it doesn't make too much difference you can always flip the switch if you want but it won't make a massive load of difference between type 1 and type 2 you can tell which is which though if you wind them on if you just wind it into the bit of tape past the header you'll see straight away there's a difference in colour between the two tapes. So you can see the tape at the bottom is recorded on ferro tape, type 1, and the type 2 chrome tape is the darker tape at the top. Now let's move away from tape types and talk about that Dolby symbol, the back-to-back -back double D that you'll see on the boxes and on the cassettes themselves. Of course, it's noise reduction. Now there are other kinds of noise reductions that were implemented, such as DBX, but by far the most popular of these was Dolby, so we're going to talk about that. Dolby noise reduction was first invented in the mid-60s and was for professional recording studios only. However, in 1968, a home version appeared which was called Dolby B, followed quite a few years later by Dolby C, and then finally by Dolby S, which was right at the end of the home cassette boom on the high-end machines only. Each version of Dolby was better than the one that came previously. So what does Dolby do and how does it work? Well, I'll try and give the briefest possible explanation I can, but if you really want to know about it properly, then look at the Wikipedia article. The idea is you want to reduce the hiss or remove it, if possible, that's on a tape. Now, you can do that by buying a metal tape as opposed to a ferric because that has a lot less hiss on it. But the idea with Dolby is it will reduce hiss irrespective of what type of tape you've bought. Now, the way you get rid of hiss, if you were just to strip it off, you'd lose some of the sound with it because there are high frequency, low volume sounds that would get removed along with the hiss if you just to filter that part of the sound out. So what Dolby does, you record with it switched on, it boosts up those parts of the sound that would have got lost, the high frequency, low volume sounds, it boosts those. And then when you play it back, you also have Dolby switched on and it brings them back down to where they should be, but also strips off the hiss off the bottom. At least that's the idea. Now, of course, there's three different types of Dolby, B, C, and S that you might have. You've got to use the same version to play it back as you did to record it. If you don't, things will sound wrong. If you were to play back a Dolby recording that was done in, say, Dolby B, without pressing the Dolby B button, it would sound too tinny, uh, too bright. Equally, if you weren't recording Dolby, but then you press the Dolby button on playback, things would sound too muffled. And of course, if you're recording Dolby S playback using Dolby S, etc. Now, if you've got a pre-recorded album and it's just got a Dolby logo on it, that'll be Dolby B. They always tend to be Dolby B. Occasionally you'll see things that say Dolby B HX Pro. Don't worry about the HX Pro. There's nothing that you have to do about that. It just means headroom extension. It was a Bang & Olufsen technology that Dolby licensed, which just makes recording sound better. There's nothing that you have to do on the playback end. Now, if you're looking to buy a machine and you want to know what kind of Dolby noise reduction it can handle, it'll usually have it written on the front. If it doesn't, have a look for the switch where you can select it. And if the switch only shows Dolby noise reduction on and off, that means it's Dolby B. 
It's just when that machine came out, they didn't know there was going to be a Dolby C and a Dolby S, so they just thought it was called Dolby Noise Reduction. Now, I'll quickly show you my main machine. It's an absolute monster. It's the Pioneer CTF-1250, but I'll be completely honest, the main reason that I bought this specific machine is because I think it looks absolutely amazing. I think it's probably in need of a service to bring it up to its full strength, but it still sounds pretty damn good. Back in its day, it was a pretty expensive machine. In fact, it's still a pretty expensive machine, but it isn't exactly fully featured. It's only got standard Dolby noise reduction. It doesn't do Dolby C or anything because it hadn't come out then. However, it does have three heads. Why are three heads better than one? Well, looking at this reel to reel, it's easy to explain. Notice we've got erase on the left, record in the middle and playback on the right. The idea is with three heads, as well as separating them out, which is supposed to be better, you can listen to what you've just recorded because the tape goes across the record head and then across the play head so you can monitor live how the recordings are sounding and adjust things appropriately. Now before the comments blow up with very opinionated people telling me what I should do such as buy an Akamichi Dragon, I'm not going to go down that route, I want to try something very specific. I've never heard a Dolby S recording and that's something I want to change. Looking at the adverts and things from the early 90s, 92 here, they were making some very bold claims for Dolby S. They were saying that it made things almost CD quality. Well, that's something that I really want to try out for myself. So I looked on eBay to see if I could find a deck with Dolby S on it. Unfortunately, they're very expensive. You see, Dolby S came right at the end of the heyday of the cassette recorder. It was only put on high-end machines at the time, and those still command a big premium. So I had to think a little bit outside of the box, and I managed to find, eventually, this. It's the Sony TCS-1. It's a MIDI deck, which was part of a hi-fi system. You could buy it separately, and it'll work on its own, and you can pick these up for, oh, as you can see here, 60-odd quid. And apparently, back in the day, this was a really high-end setup for a MIDI system anyway, and it won quite a few awards in 1995, including one in What Hi-Fi and a, a couple here as well. So I picked up one of these decks. Of course, as you can see, it's a really nice-looking machine, very importantly, Dolby S. It's got a few nice features on it as well, especially noticed up here, it's got an auto calibration feature. And that's something I haven't had before. That should enable the deck to record on cassettes to the optimum quality. Now, if we look around the back of the machine, you'll see it's a very simple setup. We've got a line in and a line out. That bus thing is to connect it to the other components in the range so you can control them all for remote control. And handily, it's got an additional socket on the back, which means I can plug other devices in my hi-fi into this, which means it won't take up an additional plug socket. Now, whilst it might be a bit of a bargain compared to those full-size decks, of course, it isn't as fully spec'd. Whilst it does have Dolby B, C, S, HX Pro, Track Skip and Auto Reverse, it is only a two-head mechanism. There was one other thing I found on eBay, and it was a pre-recorded cassette that used Dolby S noise reduction. There was an intention to release pre-recorded cassettes with Dolby S. However, this is just a promo off High Fidelity magazine, albeit it is on chrome tape, so it shouldn't sound all that bad. So I gave it a quick go. Of course, whenever you buy something off eBay, you really do hope it works, but you're never too sure. However, this was working fine. Now, once you get it into the right Dolby version, it didn't sound bad at all. However, one thing I did notice, I've got some scratches on the front of this, which is a bit of a shame. It does spoil the look a little bit. However, I do have a solution for that, and it's Brasso. Now, most people will probably know this trick, but if you don't, Brasso is a great way of getting rid of scratches off plastic, like on the front of this cassette recorder. You just have to rub it quite hard, it's abrasive, so it takes the top off it a little bit, but as you can see there, the scratches are now hardly noticeable. Now before I go and add it to the hi-fi system, I think we better have a look inside it just to check everything checks out okay. So taking the lid off, and it looks brand new in here, it was actually made, as you can see there, 23rd of August 1994, so over 21 years ago, but it looks pretty much as good as new. You can see the auto-reverse mechanism working here, spinning the head around and then playing the tape back in the other direction. And if we look at it, we can see that it's very clean, very well put together, nicely spaced out components, obviously a high-end piece of equipment back from the day. 
Anyway, put it back together and add it into the hi-fi system so we can do a bit more testing with it. Now the first thing that I want to do is, I can't really play you back any pre-recorded music because we're going to fall foul of the usual YouTube copyright stuff. However, I really would like to show you how the different noise reduction techniques, B, C or S, affect the sound. So I'm going to do that, but with a blank cassette. Now I've picked this one up that I've found lying around, Type 1. Notice it says 4CD. They always used to do things like this towards the end of the uh, cassette era, trying to advertise cassettes that were for recording CD. It isn't, it's just a normal, everyday Type 1 cassette. Now I'm going to play this tape at full volume, but there'll be nothing on it, but you'll still hear the hiss that's on the tape on its own. And then we're going to try the different noise reduction techniques to see how those affect it. So get ready for a loud noise. Right, so that was quite impressive. You've got to remember though that this is done at a volume that I would never play anything at. It's far beyond what I could listen to. But let's try this again with a metal tape. If you could hear a bit of a hum there, that was just coming from my amplifier, not from the cassette deck. It's just because I've put it way up to the top and there's a bit of a hum when you get past number nine. But I've never listened to this thing beyond about this position here, so it's not something that you'd normally hear. Now, because I'm never going to find any pre-recorded metal tapes with a Dolby S noise reduction system on them, the only way I'm going to find out how good Dolby S actually is on a good quality tape is to record my own. So I've put a cassette into the machine and I've pressed the calibrate button. Now, as far as I can tell, what this is doing is recording something onto the tape. Now it's going to listen back to it and that's going to enable it to calibrate itself so it records to its optimum quality on that particular cassette only takes a few seconds and once it's done I can find some suitable high quality recordings to test out Dolby S. So I've got some nice clean acoustic high res tracks that I can record. Now if you hear any clicks those are coming from my camera not from the source or from the cassette it's just something that my camera's picking up for some reason. Now you want to drive metal tapes quite strong so you want to go to the plus numbers a little bit get your record level just right before you start recording make sure it's just going up there into the plus four position and then take the pause off and start the recording. So I spent about 20 minutes listening to the music whilst recording it at the same time and then I rewound the cassette. It's been so long since I recorded onto tape I forgot how much fun you had while you were doing it. Anyway, listening back to the music I really couldn't tell any difference initially. I was sat there and I was amazed at how good it sounded. And I'm sure anyone would have been impressed if someone had come in and I'd have said, you're listening to a lossless recording, they'd have believed me, it sounded brilliant. But of course, a recording can't really sound as good as the original, especially on a tape. So I tried jumping back and forth between the source and the tape. And sure enough, yes, there was a bit of a difference. The original lossless file, of course, did sound better, but it was only when I compared them side by side that I could actually tell the difference. It just shows you how good you can get recordings on cassette. Now, I embrace technology new and old, and I wouldn't want to give away my digital music files and go back to having everything on analog tape. However, that said, if technology hadn't advanced beyond the metal tape and Dolby S noise reduction, I would be more than happy with the quality of the music that cassette tapes can produce. Now I know there's going to be so many people out there that are watching this and are thinking what's the point in recording onto a cassette nowadays anyway? Well, as far as I can make out, there is no point. 
it's just something to do for a bit of fun. Much like owning a model train set or going fishing, there's no real point behind it, you're just doing it because it's something you enjoy. Not everything has to have a purpose. Now if you think you'd enjoy messing around with compact cassettes and you don't have a machine at the moment, if you look up in the video description you'll find I've got some links to the sections on eBay where I go looking for the different models I bought. Now you can go two ways with this, you can go vintage, get something from the sort of 70s and 80s which looks beautiful but might need quite a bit of work doing on it before it works properly or I'd recommend if you're starting out go to something from the very end of the format's life, something in the 1990s. If you look for something there that has Dolby S on it you'll also know that that was a top of the range machine back in the day and some of those as we saw can be picked up at pretty good prices and of course if it has Dolby S on it it's going to have all the other bells and whistles as well. Now if you're buying cassettes don't get those off eBay because metal tapes are ridiculously priced on there, they're for collectors or something. What I would recommend, I've got a company that I bought these from, unbranded but wound with TDK metal tape to a certain length, whatever length you choose, at a very reasonable price and I've got a link to that company in the description as well. They're based in the UK. You might find somewhere similar if you're living in a different country locally like that, but whatever you do, don't get them off eBay, you'll just be ripping yourself off. Anyway, that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching. Sorry, I'm not a Muppet. Well, maybe I am, but not in that sense. There's something I just forgot to mention. Um, whenever I mention cassettes in a video, there's always 50, 60 people who link me to the same video about this company that's still making cassettes and going on about the fact that cassettes are now selling more than they have for years. Um, please don't do that. I've seen that video enough times. They're actually the people that made the Guardians of the Galaxy Awesome Mix Volume 1. That was something I picked up. It was a limited edition uh, cassette, which obviously after the film, uh, which is a nice little thing. But they were the company that put this together. Um, strangely enough, did it on the, as far as I can tell, Type 1 tape, which we've already discussed isn't the best way to do it, which is a bit disappointing, but nice packaging all the same. Anyway, that's all I want to say. Don't bother linking me to it. However, you know what I'll do? I'll put a link in the video description and then you can watch that video if you're one of the, I don't know, one, two, ten people on the planet that haven't seen it yet. Anyway, that's it. Sorry. Bye.